I'm excited to be here Sam. I hope you guys are too. Uh, we are um, going to jump into a great time of worship this morning. I, I overheard the, the team practicing and it, it sounded amazing, the opportunity to have uh, worship this morning. So I'm excited. So um, board members, there is a meeting next week after church, right after church. It shouldn't be too long. We've got an update about the homeschool group coming and then some other business type stuff we've got to get through. So please plan on, on being here for that. And then um, on Wednesday, I'm excited for this too, uh, we've got our Wednesday night midweek study starting up this week at 6 p.m. here at the church in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, we'll be gathering and, and talking about the doctrines of our faith and what we believe. sing. song is Waymaker. God moves through the earth via the Holy Spirit. He reaches out to mankind, provides for all our needs, makes a way for us, performs miracles, keeps his promises, and defeats darkness with his light. He will one day wipe all the tears from believers' eyes when we enter into his king, heavenly kingdom. The term waymaker is, central, is the central theme given its prominence as the song's title. Webster defines this as one that makes a road. What way did God make? By sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and to remove our sins. Let's invite you to sing with us, Waymaker, this morning.
Holy Spirit would be here with us today and to open our hearts, Lord, to Pastor Trent's message. I ask that you bless his, his tongue, that you, you'd speak clearly, and you'd guide him, Lord. Bless the offering, used to glorify and honor you, in Jesus' name. Good morning, church. So last week we opened up this series in Ephesians, and I, and I share with y'all that uh, kind of an overview of the book of Ephesians. And it was kind of like drinking from a fire hydrant, wasn't it? But there was a lot of good stuff and, and a lot of good information last week. This week we're going to continue on in this uh, study of Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to be getting through a few more verses than just the two that we did last week. We're going to be actually going through Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 today. Wow, I know. It's not as easy as it sounds. One of the commentaries that I, I constantly go back to and regularly use uh, opened up this section of study with this line. Paul is a theological thoroughbred, and Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 are his Belmont stakes. The, the self-proclaimed race unlike any other. The, the one and a half mile long track at Belmont Park is the final leg and the longest race in the Triple Crown bid. It was often said that the Belmont Stakes unlocks the doors to horse racing glory. That's quite the analogy coming back to Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, isn't it? Paul starts off, verse 3, with his general, general idea and then widens out with, with phrase after phrase that touch on the various themes without ever stopping for a period. In the original Greek writings, these 12 verses here is one long, complex, and glorious sentence that oozes with God-centered worship. And that's what we're going to read today. And this passage is important because of that, the God-centered worship. Would you agree that we've been made for praise? That the human race was made to worship? Would you agree with that statement? The question is not... Will we praise, but who we will praise? Who do we worship? If you look around at our culture, you'll find expressions of, of praise and worship all over the place. Teenage boys and girls at, at Justin Bieber and Taylor Swift concerts are screaming and praising constantly. 
Sports fans exalt their teams. They, uh, we, we pay big money to watch these, these sports teams or we watch them on TV. We change our entire life schedule around to watch our favorite team. Men, we get fired up about going to Home Depot and the smell of the wood. We get excited and we, we enjoy going to Home Depot to start that new project. We all have our favorite stores that we like to go to. Netflix fans and streaming fans have their favorite show that they can't stop talking about. My sister's question every time we see her is, what show are you watching now? I'm watching this, 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 and this, and this all at once. We have our favorites and we worship. The worst of us, though, are us coffee drinkers, right? We love our favorite coffee. You know what I'm talking about. We have our favorite coffee shops. My mom has... has always got dedicated herself to one coffee shop and when she moved to Ohio her world was rocked when she had to find a new coffee shop to go to we love our coffee so when you think about it humanity has never really had a problem expressing praise have we the problem has been where or or whom is that praise expressed to And in regard to functioning idols, we like to take good things that God has given us in creation and we turn them into God things. We take things like food and and work and relationships and and sex and and hobbies that we enjoy doing and so on. and, And we take these things and we begin to substitute them for our creator and our redeemer good things into God things. And by doing that, we turn these things into idols and we end up committing idolatry fairly often. And yes, we can chuckle at some of these things on the list, but in reality, it's no small matter for us. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 1 that that failure to worship God is at the heart of all sin. Meaning any sin problem that we have is functionally a worship problem. And we can all become susceptible to idolatry when we have the wrong view of God. We know that God has revealed himself to us in his word, and our worship is a response to what he has revealed. We shouldn't worship the God of our imagination, should we? But we should worship the God of the Bible, We should believe what the Bible actually says is true and not what we want the Bible to say to be true. If you remember from last week in in, in Ephesus, the people had numerous objects of worship. From the goddess Diana to to the emperor Caesar, they had these little figurines of of literal idols to worship. So the question that we're going to ask and answer this morning as we read This next section in Paul's writing is this. Who do we worship? Who do we worship? The answer to that question, as we'll see today, is this. We should worship the triune God for who he is and what he does for us. But before we dive into this passage, before we go any further. Unfortunately, this passage has actually generated a lot of debate over the years because it mentions concepts of election and predestination. And we're going to be looking at both of those concepts today. We're going to be spending some time dissecting those and explaining and hopefully understanding them. But I don't want us to miss the point of what Paul's trying to get across to us today. The point of the text is worship. The theme for today is is the worship and the praise of God. Verse 3 starts out with a note of praise. And then verse 14, at the end of this, this extremely long sentence, is praise. Praise is seen throughout the entire thing. We're going to see the the Trinitarian nature of this passage. These, These 12 verses can be broken up into three different sections. We're going to see the work of the Father in the verses 3 through 6. We're going to see the work of the Son in verses 7 through 10, and the work of the Spirit in verses 11 through 14. We see all parts of the Trinity 
in this passage of worship. You see, this, this passage is Paul calling us to worship the triune God. Why? Because of what we see in these three verses, specifically verse 3, because from God is from whom all blessings flow. And that's the reason why we should praise God, because all blessings that we have are given to us by him. And Paul gives us three of the blessings in, in this passage today. He reminds us that we have been chosen by the Father, redeemed by the Son, and assured by the Spirit. So let's pray, and we're going to dive into this sentence. Father, I ask right now for the understanding that we need to grasp the concept in this passage. Father, I ask for your wisdom and your grace when, when reading this, that, that we can understand who you are and what you have done for us so that we can worship you correctly. Father, we pray this in your son's name. Amen. So if you haven't done so already, open your Bible, turn it on if it's electronic, and find your way to Ephesians chapter 1. We'll be starting in verse 3 this morning. And verse 3 starts, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Wow. We're going to stop there for just a second. We could read this verse three or four more times and just call it good with what we need to worship God, right? We have an infinite amount of worship material in this one verse alone. I can't think of anything more wonderful than the truths of this verse. But we must continue. So all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. So we're going to get right into the hard stuff this morning. Paul doesn't waste any time mentoring this doctrine of election or, or predestination, does he? No, but, but in this amazing passage, what Paul highlights here is God's gracious election of sinners for salvation. Now, the NLT uses the phrase, chose us. It says that Paul, uh, Paul says that God chose us, meaning election here, and, and that he decided in advance, and that's meaning, that means predestination. And, and these words can cause some confusion, some some. Uh, caution for some people. These words make some people tense, and I think that's, that's probably why the NLT decided to use synonyms for it. But really, words like election and predestination shouldn't cause us any issues. These are Bible words. We should, we should be excited for these words because of what they mean to us. They should inspire awe and worship from us. Election, or, or the doctrine of election, it is God's choosing of us, you and me, together in Christ. Isn't that a wonderful concept, that God has chosen us? And Paul tells us that's a, a blessing to be chosen. You see, those who are, who are lost, which is just a, a churchy word for those who don't believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord, but, but those who are lost aren't lost because they haven't been elected. They're lost because they're sinners and they've chosen to remain sinners. The concepts of election and, and predestination are often brought up in contrast to man's free will. Uh, and, and this is typically a, a black and white type of argument. You could either have free will or you could either have God's election, but you can't possibly have both, can you? 
But from scripture, I don't see that as a fair and accurate representation of what, what God teaches us. We call that an either or fallacy, meaning that, that, that you could either have one or the other, but not both. And we're going to talk about that a little more in just a few minutes here. But we need to understand that, that free will in man is never violated by the election of God. And the election of God never violates the free man of will. And, and people are elected to glorify God. Now this idea of, of God choosing people to display his glory is not new it's not a new concept. It's not a new teaching from Paul in the New Testament. The Bible is a book of election. We see it time and time again. God chose to create the world for his glory. God chose Abraham to bring blessings to the nations in Genesis 12. God chose the nation of Israel so that they may be a light to the nations in Deuteronomy 7 and 14. Furthermore, Jesus chose his 12 disciples to bear fruit and to multiply the gospel in John 15. And Paul wrote that God chose what is insignificant and despised in this world so that no one can boast in his presence in 1 Corinthians 1. So we see that God has done a lot of choosing throughout the scriptures. And now here in Ephesians, as well as Romans 9 through 11, Acts 13, Titus 1, 1 Peter chapter 1 and 2 Peter chapter 1, we read that God chose individuals for salvation. And in these people whom God has chosen, both Jews and Gentiles, as we see in our passage today, these are the people that make up the church. God chose a people for himself. And that people are made up of believing, redeemed, and forgiven members. So I'm going to make a few more observations about the nature of election in this passage. First of all, and, and this might be the most important observation that we need to make when talking about election or predestination, we must admit and accept that there is a great mystery when talking about these concepts. This passage speaks about what God was doing before he made the world. It speaks of God deciding in advance to fulfill his plan. Was anybody around before the world? I wasn't. So we must admit and accept that there, there is some mystery here to these concepts, to these, these ideas. And, and we need to trust that God is God and that we are not God. Deuteronomy 29 says that the secret things belong to Lord our God. It doesn't say that they belong to us. Now some of us might disagree on the finer points of this, of this mystery that is doctrine of election, but, but we can and we should still fellowship and serve and, and love each other and be united in Christ together. Because it's difficult for finite creatures like us. We, we, we only have three-pound brains that have been affected by the fall and sin. So it's difficult for us to comprehend the doctrines that, that relate to human choice. And we should be okay with mystery when it comes to God. We should, and uh, when, when we encounter mystery when it comes to God, it should cue us to start to worship God even more. God who is infinitely greater and infinitely wiser than we could ever be. That's cause for worship. Secondly, we want to admit and accept, while we want to admit and accept this mystery, we should also acknowledge the other attributes which are clearly affirmed in this text. In this text, we see that God is perfectly loving, eternally sovereign, gracious, uh, gloriously gracious, and infinitely wise. And, and we'll see the wise one in verse 8 when we get there. Psalm 115 verse 3 says that, that our God is in the heavens and he does what he wishes. God does whatever he pleases. 
And whatever he pleases is consistent with who he is. So God is loving. Election is is an expression of God's love for his children. Verse 4 says that God loved us and chose us in Christ. God is loving. God is sovereign. God's choosing is simply an expression of his internal control over all things. God is also gracious. God's choosing is an, ex- is an expression of his grace to sinners. You know, he didn't choose us because we were great ourselves. He chose us not because of anything good in us, but it was by his grace alone. 2 Timothy 1.9, which we read earlier, says, For God saved us not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. And finally, God is wise. God's choosing is, is an expression of his infinite wisdom. He knows more. He knows better than us. And these are attributes that we can't acknowledge that aren't mysterious to us that we read in this passage. The third observation is this. This passage itself shows us the necessity of personal belief in the gospel. This is true, even if, if all of our questions about this mystery aren't answered, or, or human responsibility. If we jump ahead to verse 13, it says, and when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own. Remember, this is one long, complex sentence, and, and in this sentence of election, and faith, they're all tied together. Your belief is part of the process of election. We may not understand this, but we should embrace it. We have embraced other truths uh, that are mysteriously woven together. We we accept that, that Christ was fully God and fully man, even though we can't possibly comprehend what that really means. We also accept the divine human authorship of Scripture. Man wrote it down, but it was inspired by God. How to perfectly rectify that is a mystery to us, but we accept it. Someone once asked a pastor about this problem, talking about predestination and free will. And his response was this This is not my problem. This is God's problem. And for God, it isn't a problem. God understands everything. God can perfectly weave all these concepts together perfectly. We don't have to sit here and and worry ourselves trying to figure that out. We can trust God when he says it works. There are some, though, who get the wrong idea about election. For some, it casts doubt on whether or not all are truly welcomed to come to Jesus. And that casts doubt and raises concerns about the need for us to evangelize and and share the gospel. But election doesn't lessen the need to tell people about Jesus. Instead, election gives us hope in evangelism. We should have hope when we go out and share the gospel. God has given us some of the wisdom, but he hasn't granted us full access into his infinite wisdom. God knows who's elected, but we don't. And we've been commanded in scripture multiple times to go and share the gospel, to tell people about Jesus, to share God's love with our neighbor. Some people will believe when we share the gospel. Some people won't. But we can trust that even the hardest of hearts can be converted because evangelism is not about the quality of our presentation, but about the power of God. Paul was a very hard heart at one point before he became Paul, Saul, right? That's about as hard as you could get. And the power of God changed him. It could happen today still. 
And really, in, in light of the doctrine of election, we shouldn't have any fears when we share the gospel because God is sovereign. We should assume that, that God has placed us where we are for the purpose of seeing others come to know Christ themselves. Two more observations. Number four is our election is in Christ. We are not chosen for anything good in us. God accepts us because he chose us to be in union with Christ. God chose believers in Christ before the foundation of the world. That means that you and I didn't do any of the choosing. And finally, number five, after considering all these things, all the observations, one through four, election should humble us. We should be humbled when we consider the election. The proper response to God's choosing us for salvation is not entitlement. It's not arrogance. It's not pride, but rather awe and worship and complete obedience to God. Election should humble every believer. Anyone, and, and unfortunately there are some, but anyone uh, who calls themselves a believer and wishes to argue against this, this necessity to be humble, I, I'm going to turn them to Romans uh, chapter 9, verse 20, which says, who are you but a mere human to argue with God? We shouldn't be arrogant. We shouldn't be prideful. This doctrine should put us flat on our faces in worship of the sovereign, wise, loving gracious and mysterious God who has chosen us in Christ. There are two goals to election that we should look at. The two goals are holiness and adoption. Holiness, that's, that's God's goal is that we would be holy without fault in his eyes. And God's purpose is to bring us into conformity with Jesus. We talked last week about our position in Christ. And, and that's the first half of Ephesians that, that Paul discusses is our position in Christ. It's only in Christ we are holy positionally. We can stand before God because of Christ. In Christ our blame is removed and, and his righteousness is then given to us. God sees us as holy because his son is holy, but only if we are in him. Praise God. And once we're positionally holy, then we'll, we'll look at the, the responsibility of pursuing holiness practically, and, and we'll get there in chapters 4 through 6. But, but we are holy in Christ. And the next goal is adoption. It says, God decided in advance, or, or God predestined to adopt us into his family. His people are a part of the family of God, which means that we have this overwhelming privilege to talk to God, the, the God of the universe, the God who created all things, and call him Father. Father. Again, praise God, right? I love how Paul gives us this little lesson on adoption here. What, what, what does it mean to be adopted? It means that we all have the rights and, and the privileges that belong to the father's children. Paul uses the Greek word for adoption only five times in the New Testament. And each time it was used... Uh, for those who are familiar with the Roman concept of adoption. The, the Romans were, were very familiar with adoption. And perhaps the most famous adoption at that time was, was Julius Caesar's adoption of Octavian, also known as Caesar Augustus. He got a name change. The, and, and Augustus was the Roman emperor who decreed the census that forced Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem to fulfill the prophecy of the Messiah's birthplace. Can you imagine for just a second how amazing it would be to be adopted by Caesar of all people? Having all the rights and privileges that came with being a child of the emperor. 
Well, Paul says that's nothing compared to being adopted by the glorious Father. We have all the rights and privileges of God's family. Adoption also has this, this horizontal aspect to it. It's not just the vertical adoption with, with God and you, but it's, it's horizontal. Not only is God our Father, but we also now have brothers and sisters in Christ. We are a family. The church, which is us, we are a family of adopted brothers and sisters in Christ. Praise God. Holiness and adoption, those are the, the two goals of God's election. So I hope that you can see that, that election and, and predestination are not concepts to be feared, but instead they should be viewed as these incredible blessings that, that, uh, that have been given to us, these privilege, the, uh, privileges that we have. And that's why we should praise God, because of the work of the Father and because we are chosen by the Father. Next, we should praise God for the work of the Son because we are redeemed by the Son. Building on what has already been said about the blessings we have in Christ, Paul now overflows with praise to God for the work of the Son, which is the great redemption accomplished through Christ, the, the forgiveness of our sins because of his death, and the rich inheritance that, will, uh, that is ours when we believe. So let's go back to Scripture and and read the next section of verses here, starting in verse 7. It says, He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his Son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us, along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us the mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. So to start here, we have redemption. Redemption is the act of, of saving or, or being saved from an imprisonment or slavery. Israel, when they were taken from Egypt as slaves, they were redeemed out of slavery. And now this, this is pretty cool. Our redemption, being freed from sin, is spoken of here in Scripture as an event that has already taken place. Paul says that he has purchased our freedom and he forgave our sins. It's, it's a done deal. We, it's not like we have hope of redemption in the future at some point. We already have redemption. Colossians 1, 13 through 14 says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. God has, has done the work of rescuing us transferring us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and forgiveness. Praise God. And this freedom, this redemption that we have has come at a cost. We have the deliverance from sin because, as Paul says, it was purchased with the blood of Christ. We have been redeemed from the penalty of sin and from the prison of sin, but it wasn't cheap. Our freedom cost Jesus his blood. He took our place. He bore our sins on the cross. He died the death that we deserved. Praise God. We also have grace. Redemption and forgiveness are because, as Paul says, he is so rich in kindness and grace. Jesus has lavishly poured out his grace on us. We are the recipients of, of Christ's extravagant grace and kindness. 
We also have wisdom and understanding because of God's expressing his grace on us. God's dispensing of grace and redemption involves understanding and wisdom to know how to live right, how to live in his saving plans for us. We see that in verses 9 and 10, and, and, and those verses are the climactic peak of this passage where Paul says that all things will be brought together in Christ. That's the unity that we're searching for. It's only by God's grace that, that he has now revealed to us his mysterious will. God has revealed to us his eternal plan. And that plan, as he says here, is focused on Christ. What's the plan, you ask? That's, that's probably the, the most commonly asked question, the most sought-after answer for believers. What is God's plan? The answer is right here in verse 10. It says, and this is the plan. We know it right here. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. God's plan is to unite all things in Christ, the things in heaven, the things on earth, everything, all of it united in Christ. But I'm just trying to figure out what God's plan is for my life. I, I don't know what, what God's plan in all of this, this turmoil that I experience is. Have you ever heard anybody say those things? Or have you ever said those things? We know God's plan. He, he's given it to us in verse 10 here. God's plan for your life is to be united with everything in Christ. The process may look different. We may be on a different path to get to God's plan. God's going to work differently in you than he is in me, but, but the plan, the end goal, the, the desired position of God is that we are all united together as one body, praising God under the perfect authority of Jesus Christ. That's the plan for our lives. Praise God for the work of the Son because we are redeemed by the Son. And finally, we should praise God for the work of the Spirit because we are assured by the Spirit. On top of all the other blessings that, that have already been mentioned, Paul now references the believer's inheritance in the final few verses that we'll look at today. So let's read those now, starting again in verse 11. It says, Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance and makes everything work out according to his plan. God's purpose was that we Jews, who were the first to trust in Christ, would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised, and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. The Holy Spirit is our guarantee of the inheritance that has been promised to us. And that, too, should lead us to praise God. In verse 11, Paul says, we have received an inheritance from God. That, that entire line there, it, it, the, the five words in English, we have received an inheritance, is actually a single compound word in the Greek language. And, and it's, it's actually pretty difficult for, for English to translate that word correctly. There are two meanings that it could have. The first one is we have received an inheritance, as we read in our Bible. 
The second one is we have become God's inheritance. And my, my Bible makes that footnote for us. Yours probably does too. We have become God's inheritance. The second one is the notion that, that we have become God's possession. An idea that is repeated over and over again in the Old Testament. We have become God's possession. The, the first one, we have received an inheritance, is, is more like what we read in 1 Peter chapter 1, 3, and 4. It says, an inheritance is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach and change of decay. Truly, both are great options, aren't they? Wouldn't you agree with that? That we have an inheritance and we have become God's inheritance? Through, through Christ, we are God's possession. And we have a glorious inheritance. Both are true. And I'm not going to stand here today and, and, and pretend that I have a full grasp on this tremendous statement that God makes here. But I will tell you that because of it, I'm going to praise God. I'll praise God because I am God's. I'll praise God because of the inheritance that belongs to me. Christ belongs to me. God belongs to me. The Spirit belongs to me. Isn't that great? And on the flip side, I am Christ's. I am God's. I am the Spirit's. That is just as great of a statement. Praise God. And how has this happened, though? How do we have such an inheritance and, and such a future that, that we don't deserve? And from a divine perspective, it's, it's according to God's sovereign purposes. It's because... God has decided to give it to us. In verse 11, Paul says, He, meaning God, chose in advance, and He makes everything work out according to His plan. God chose to do this for us. And from a human perspective, it's because we've believed. Paul mentions the responsibility of the people and, and by saying those who were first to trust in Christ, talking about the Jews, they, they chose to trust in Christ. And those who have heard the truth, the good news that God saves you and believed in Christ, he's talking about the Gentiles here. It's, it's both, right? Once again, it's this mysterious plan of God's sovereignty and, and human responsibility that, that people have received salvation when they hear the gospel and believe in Christ, but it was also God who gave it to us freely without anything that we could do. It's a mystery for us. It's not a problem for God. But also notice here in this passage, don't, don't get lost with that, that election and, and, and predestination talk. Because we also see here uh, this movement separating, uh, uh, separately identifying the Jews and the Gentiles, and then moving to a unified we that Paul uses. Paul says, we are united in Christ. We have received an inheritance he will give us the inheritance so we would praise and glorify him. Paul is, is clarifying to the church in, in Ephesus here that the inheritance that is promised is not limited to a specific group of people. The Jewish believers had the first taste, yes, but, but the Gentile believers are also full recipients of God's amazing grace. Paul's saying that there are no second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. All believers are God's possession. And all believers have, have been redeemed for his glory. And every believer has been sealed by the Spirit. And that seal gives us our assurance. A seal is a mark of ownership or authenticity. Think of it as, as a brand that we put on cattle. The, the same imagery that Paul used here as a seal would have made sense 
for the churches that were on the outlying parts of Ephesus. But it also would have made sense for the slaves who were branded inside the city limits by their masters. It's a, it's a beautiful combination that everybody would have understood in Paul's writing here. And those seals, as we know, are external. They're on the outside. But the seal that we have from the Spirit is an internal seal. God has put his seal on our hearts. We are marked for God. We are sealed for God by the Holy Spirit. And that's the guarantee of our final inheritance. God's not going to look on the outside. He's going to look at our hearts and say, yes, you are marked for me. And the Spirit is the first installment or the down payment which is provided for the glory that is to come. God doesn't just tell us about the future to come. He gives us, he allows us to experience it now by sealing us with the Spirit. So what? Once again, Paul ends this passage with the note, he did this so that we would praise and glorify him. There's really nothing left to do but to join Paul in worship and declare God's praises and worship him. God the Father has chosen us. God the Son has redeemed us. And God the Spirit has assured us. We were made for praise and our hearts will only be satisfied when we're praising God. So let's pray, and then we'll have a chance to sing and, and, and close out our, our morning by praising God. Father, we love you so much. Father, I thank you for your word, for the plan that you have laid out before us. Father, I thank you for choosing us, for redeeming us, and for assuring us. It's a beautiful mystery, but it's all done because you love us. And in response, Father God, we want to worship you today. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. I invite you to praise him in our closing song, There is a Redeemer. I invite you to stand as we sing. Yeah. Uh -huh.
Jesus.